Hola, buenos días. Good morning, delegate. We don't have a lot of time, but we would like to start. So I'm Marco, and I'm an advisor of the church in Guatemala, and I'm here with three participants that are very distinguished. And I would like to present to you Luis Fernando Mendoza Jimenez. He is graduated in political science of the University of Costa Rica, and he also has studies in economy economics, and he has been a professor and a researcher in, when it comes to health and, and economic science from Costa Rica University. Right now, he's an advisor of the parliament in Costa Rica. He was a congressman in 2010 to 2014 and president of the parliament in Costa Rica from two, on 2014. He was in the forum in the legislative area from Central America and Dominican Republic. And he has a lot of the things and the foundations that he had to work on in the folk area. Uh, we have Cesar Hardigay. He is an attorney from, from Monterrey, Chihuahua, Mexico, where he obtained his, um, his master's in, um, in business administration. Right now, he is studying also um, in the Universidad Autónoma de Mexico. He's a member of the PAN. Uh, political party, and he is also is part and coordinator and also congressman in some of the positions that he has been served. He has served as a congressman, federal congressman in 2000. He was a senator of the republic, and he also took upon the advisor of 2009 and 2014 in the federal area. He has been an attorney in so many different uh, times, different areas, and, and he has been an attorney in all kinds of things in different settings. We have Luis Fernando Morales Nunez. He's a director, a general director of administration from, uh, he graduated in law from the University University of Las Americas Puebla, and uh, he has held important positions in the government of Mexico, and etc. También tenemos. So we also have. Uh, Fabricio Alvarado, who is a singer from Costa Rica, and I ask him the blessing to offer a song for us. And then after this song that he's going to present to us, I have another announcement, and the most important of everything is that today is today his birthday, Caesar's birthday. And after the song from Fabricio, we would like to sing Las Mañanitas. Muy buenos días. Básicamente, no, no voy a. Good morning. Gastar mucho tiempo. I'm not going to waste a lot of time, but this song, they asked me to sing, and which one should I sing? I said. And I remember that Jesus said that the kingdom of heaven is like children. I have a, I have a five-year-old daughter and a one-year-old. And one day I sat with my daughter and we started uh, writing a song. And he, she said, let's uh, write a song for Jesus. And then I said, what would you like to tell Jesus? And this song comes from what my daughter told me that day that I wanted to tell Jesus. And this is a song that's very simple, but it has the requirements 
that comes from the heart of five years old. And I would like to share it with you. My throat is not in the best condition, so I apologize for any weird sound. But what's important is that through this song, we love Jesus and we praise him. Okay. <laughs> Jesús, te amo con todo mi corazón, te necesito, llena mi vida, Jesús, Jesús, te amo con todo mi corazón. Te necesito, llena mi vida, Jesús, Jesús, sé que siempre vas a estar conmigo, solo en ti tengo seguridad. Solo en ti yo siempre tengo paz. Jesús, Jesús, sé que siempre vas a estar conmigo. Solo en ti tengo seguridad. Solo en ti yo siempre tengo paz. Jesús, Jesús, te amo con todo mi corazón. Te necesito, llena mi vida. Jesús, Jesús. Te amo con todo mi corazón, te necesito, llena mi vida, Jesús, Jesús, sé que siempre vas a estar conmigo, solo en ti tengo seguridad. Solo en ti yo siempre tengo paz Jesús, Jesús Sé que siempre vas a estar conmigo Solo en ti tengo seguridad Solo en ti yo siempre tengo paz, Jesús, Jesús. Dios les bendiga. God bless you. El asunto es que eh, no me sé las mañanitas, pero the sí. thing is that I don't know the happy birthday song, but I do know the uh, music, so we're going to invite any of you, especially if there's a Mexican here, if you could uh, have the courage, he can come up and sing, and then I'll play the accompaniment. Or anyone who knows the song. Come up front, all the Mexicans, come up front.
Recent Religious History of Costa Rica. Good morning, everyone. And uh, I would like to uh, really uh, thank Mark for, for the uh, courtesy of having come to uh, Costa Rica to invite us to participate in this symposium, and also to Maleri Cordon, also a great friend of mine, and also to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and to uh, BYU for having invited us. And the Father is not here, but I'd like to make a public confession. When, when I was... Oh, sorry, yeah, yeah, with the Argentinian priests, because there's several priests here. When I uh, became a member of the... Uh, presidency of the Congress of Costa Rica, one of the most important tasks was to invite people in the country to make a report. And the uh, main characteristic that they uh, said of me was that they never thought that I would even become the, uh, the uh, second last person in my class in school because I was always really nervous of speaking in public when I was a child, and so I'd like to confess to all of you that I, I still have this uh, fear of public speaking, but uh, at least with the songs, uh, and also because I uh, love folklore, and so that has filled me with a lot of courage. And I would like to mention two ideas that are what are going to, what this presentation is going to be about, and in the uh, inaugural address by some Africans, they said, how does religious freedom contribute to societal stability? And what can we do to continue to promote religious freedom? I would like to say that among the three or four points that I'm going to talk about, one has to do with the uh, a more extensive explanation of what was made yesterday by the presenters from Costa Rica and the, the reasons for why there's confidentiality in the Costa Rican state. And another topic is the role of the Catholic Church in terms of conflict resolution in Costa Rica. And a third topic that I'd like to at least uh, explain um, briefly is the orientation of the new order among religious groups and emerging groups that have traditions that are different from those that traditionally have existed in Costa Rica. And that's the framework that we have in Costa Rica to discuss the uh, religious freedom um, bill. And I'd also like to talk about what has been discussed between the uh, Catholic Church and evangelical groups. Things that are being discussed that are very sensible and then also the action of church in terms of uh, social conflicts in Central America. I'd like to uh, briefly mention what uh, uh, especially the Catholic Church has discussed in, in this area in terms of social conflicts. Okay, uh, here it is. I would like to mention with regard to what has been very typical among everything that's been discussed among the... Uh, Costa Rica has a history that is similar to other Latin American countries. Religious tolerance is something that is deeply entrenched in Costa Rica. Currently, the more than 80 religions as a result of immigration into the country. And this statement might be a little bit contradictory to what uh, the conflicts that we talked about yesterday, but I'd like to say that there is no such contradiction. The Costa Rican people, 95% of Costa Ricans, 
are tolerant in the area in, in terms of religion and the uh, link between the church and the society and sorry I'd like to say that this tolerance has not always existed during the colonial era when the Spanish conquistadors came like in the rest of Latin America there is a the Catholic religion was the uh, dominating and ruling religion and but and nowadays in society priests can uh, be uh, directors in society and this was also mentioned by other speakers especially by the um, priests served as teachers as doctors as nurses so they were everything in the communities when uh, Costa Rica became independent in the case of Central America, it was an independence uh, throughout the uh, Central American uh, isthmus. The Catholic Church was able to perpetuate its ideas, but its power and influence became weaker, and this led to a process of adaptation of a new reality in order to uh, recover some of the power that it had previously. There were concepts of uh, liberalism that were introduced there were young people who studied in Europe and they began to have a lot of doubts about traditional religion and the uh, homogeneity that had existed under the Catholic Church began to go away and this was also expressed in the Constitution and in the legal framework and although there have been some variations over time and until the present day the uh, religious nature of the Catholic Church in Costa Rica has been maintained. For instance, in Article 75 of the Costa Rican Constitution says specifically that the Roman Catholic religion is the state religion which contributes to the uh, freedom of practicing other religions that are not opposed to good customs and morals. And, and nowadays, Christianity is the uh, most uh, prevalent religion in Costa Rica. And uh, most people are, are Catholic. And uh, the uh, religious people in Parliament Religious people in the Costa Rican Parliament. Since the 1990s, the political parties that have a religious definition or identity have have a very important participation, specifically specifically the evangelical political parties. Currently, there are three there are three political parties such as the uh, Restoration, which, and also the Democratic Christian Alliance, they have congressmen in, in, the, political, in, in, the, in the Costa Rican parliament. And uh, currently, the parliament has four representatives from those political parties, but there's also a political party that was able to incorporate two former Catholic priests, and uh, this is actually a leftist party, and uh, the uh, current government began its administration with a uh, minister, a Lutheran bishop, and one of the main government agencies also has a Catholic priest. Logically, this sh shows some, something that's very different in terms of the participation of the various churches in the Costa Rican Parliament. Now, before I go on to the second topic, which has to do with uh, the participation of the church in the different co social conflicts, I would like to mention that Costa Rica has been a country that over time has, has an extensive democratic and social stability tradition. And this tradi tradition is, is also uh, seen in the Alternative Dispute Resolution or Conflict Resolution Act. There are a couple of examples I'd like to mention where the church has participated 
openly and strongly in resolving some of the conflicts in Costa Rica. In 2000, in fact, a uh, legal bill was approved that, that sought to improve public services such as electricity and telecommunications so that they could become privatized and as a result there is enormous social mobilization resulting in the consequences you can imagine. Um, you can see the picture, there were road closures, uh, there were protests among the population and in fact uh, the Catholic pre um, Church caused for a facilitating commission to be created and also with participation of the uh, Catholic Church and other groups and this situation was then resolved and this is a very clear example where the church intervenes directly in a social conflict and other conflicts include one that was very interesting and which was also resonated uh, considerably at an international level. This had to do with the free trade agreement with the United States where the Catholic Church took a position which was interesting. It was a position where some pastors were against and some were in f favor and the Catholic Church lost the neutrality that it had traditionally been had in conflict resolution. So all it was able to do was to there, and so the free trade agreement was proposed through a public consultation so that through a referendum it could be approved or a decision could be made with regard to the uh, future of this legal bill. The Catholic Church also, since it had lost its legitimacy, what the bishops did eventually was to call upon the population, upon the citizens, in order to participate widely in the referendum. And so the... Um, the Catholic Church sets aside, steps aside, but calls upon the citizens to participate in, in that decision. With regard to the uh, context within which our country is currently and with the new relationship between the citizens and the political and power and religion, I would like to tell you that some of the topics that are being discussed today openly and that have begun to show some distancing between the church and the different groups and also the political power itself. These are topics that some of which are now in the Costa Rican Parliament such as civil, civil societies and also some people, some countries don't have this type of legislation in terms of uh, civil unions, also religious freedom, sex education, and abortion. One topic that I find important that has to do with tolerance in Costa Rica, and uh, perhaps I'll mention in just a minute, but there was one extraordinary case that took place about a year and a half or two years ago where in Costa Rica, August 2nd is a very important holiday which has to do with the celebration of the Virgin of the Angels, um, which is the most important Catholic holiday in Costa Rica, where about a million people walk in a procession toward the Los Angeles Basilica. And on August 2nd, the 12th of August, is, there's a very important celebration where all the government people participate and also the uh, ca Catholic leadership. And so, well, on that day, two years ago, the Catholic Church requested the, uh, the government to make a confession of faith and what they were seeking were two people. One, ask God for forgiveness for the acts that we hadn't made back then. I was the uh, president of parliament. So to ask forgiveness for the acts that uh, had a negative impact on society and to put in God's hands all decisions that we were making. Because of that decision and that act, we were sent to uh, court and we spent a lot of time with the lawyers trying to defend ourselves 
because of a minority representative who had what they called yesterday uh, heterophobia against those who profess a faith in, in Central America and briefly. And I think that we are running out of time. The Catholic Church has had a very important role in terms of conflict resolution in Central America. We have This has been mentioned on many occasions, such as in Honduras, Panama, Guatemala, Guatemala and El Salvador during the uh, conflicts in the 70s and 80s, where they uh, where the uh, blood of pastors was spilled in terms of civil war in Central America, and so they were trying to resolve political conflicts in Central America. And this has been, this is where the Catholic Church especially has participated in Costa Rica. And I believe that this answers the original question or the question that was uh, made during the opening of this symposium of how religion tries to help society resolve conflicts. Thank you very much and have a good day. Good afternoon. Thank you for your displays of affection that you have offered me, particularly because if even if the symposium is not that good, I have guaranteed an applause. In the case of Mexico, Speaking of religion is a natural process because the country has always been a very devout people. Since the pre-Hispanic times, there has been a faith. In 500 years of our Aztec heritage allowed, allowed us to have a Quetzalcoatl where there was always a spiritual realm that helped the people in those times. The 300 years of Spanish rule brought us the consequence of, subs of a substitution of the deities that we worshipped, which were multiple, and it was substituted by a single creator. The case is very well known in Mexico, what there was Tlalo, the god of rain, who was substituted by San Isidro, which was a saint that we prayed to when we wanted it to rain. And these types of circumstances were not easy to introduce to the people because when you have a belief, substituting it with another belief, there must be generations that go by. That's why I said it was 300 years and intolerance that were that could be felt. There was a Marquez de Croa that when the this change was taking place, the indigenous people said, he said to the people, know it from now on that the desires of the monarch that rules you from Spain, all that is given to you is to be quiet and obey, and you must not interfere with the high matters of government. These are the kinds of thinkings that took place then that sometimes still take place in certain regions of the country because the aspect of religious liberties in the case of Mexico happened in 1824 where the conditions were generated so an official religion could be recognized, such as the Catholic Church. Nevertheless, it was just a little bit of time where this was present because midway through the 19th century, there was a reformation that brought as its consequence the separation of church and state. It became a strong differential conversation where in the Constitution of 1917, this Constitution that was given after the revolution, many interpreted it as to generate, in order to generate peace in the country, you had to be a, open to other beliefs. And this is where the Cristera War took place, where there was no respect and no tolerance. And this is a, a delicate theme because as we spoke in the panel before, what is the difference between tolerance and respect? Mr. Cordurja, he spoke of tolerance because that is what we traditionally manifest, but this is an expression that has many connotations that go along with it. Tolerating is to accept something that I don't like. That's why in New York, when the anti-crime it said it was a zero tolerance program. 
So if there are other cons considerations, such as the tolerance zone, where the girls are present, but these are all considerations that don't have a precision that the word respect does have. So the respect that must be given to different religions within religious freedom must be present in the Constitution. In the case of Mexico, when the reform took place in the Constitution in order to give the guaranteed human rights and in the beginning to human beings as individuals and then the expanded rights, not only those established in the Constitution but in the to be included in the international treaties that are accepted by the country. So that is why we adhere ourselves to Article 18 about human rights and the rights of human beings. This article states all the possibilities of action and all the, the wide range that the religions have so that they are able to profess their beliefs and have a freedom of thinking. This is established. Nevertheless, in Mexico, many become frightened by this concept, and that's why there was a reformation in the year 2010 to establish that in Mexico, when the changes were taking place, Mexico had to declare itself as a secular state. We are a democratic state, and it is secular and federal. The changes that took place in 1992, which to some people seemed like they were betraying some of the heroes of the nation, it was a taboo topic. Those They considered to be the, the fundamental clauses that were in the Constitution, and they did not want them changed. Nevertheless, in 1992, that fundamental change took place where we recognized the freedom of religion and of public worship of weddings that not always take place within temples. All of these spoke of the rights the believers have to profess a faith that is not necessarily having to be done in private, but that they could profess in public the things that they believed. Nevertheless, recognizing this, we must state not everybody in the country was in agreement. In 1992, this, there was a strong opposition from a small number, but a president like Salinas de Gortari accepted it. But we must say that the debate was not a simple one. It was a very heated debate because there was 13 legislators from, the, from one of the political parties that was radically opposed to have any type of relationship with the Vatican. They said that they were a make-believe government. They said, why do we need to speak of spir spirituality when we are speaking of earthly things? There were 13 legislators from the PPS, and none of them signed up to speak for it. There was 13 against it and nobody for it. And fortunately, with the speech that was made, things were made a little bit more calm so that the reform could be approved. And I would like to say that in that occasion, there was many clergy present that were awaiting the, the final decision. So when the debate came up and everybody was against it, Diego Fernandez said, how curious it is that that these 13 men have such an influence on what we dictate as a country. And he spoke for the faith, and he said that it wasn't so much that he was... Re he referred to a poet back then. He said, to God I go... He said, I am of dar light and of darkness, and I wish to give myself to those, to both. So that was the end of the debate. The reform was accepted, and that is where the rights were amplified. But this amplification was not taken fully, because when a law is established without a general consensus, 
it was a republic without Republicans. And the same thing was happening here. It was a constitution that accepted rights, but they were not exercised. And when things are not exercised, they atrophy. And that is unfortunately what has been happening never, despite the, the small steps that we have been taking. What happens is that the expressions of religion are very limited because of the fear that there is of some type of oppression. If we could undignified because it does not allow freedom to be expressed fully. And we must remember that dignity comes from deity and we are dignified as, as we approximate ourselves to God and we are undignified if we further ourselves from our Creator. So when we are not able to manifest and express ourselves, it is clear that we are not living true to our deity. And it has occurred in several cases where there are religious persecutions. In Mexico, there was a murder of 43 people. There were There's corruption from the first level, and everybody is in, involved in it. But churches remain on the margins. Like if they had no liberty to express themselves, and they must be able to express themselves because when they are not able to, when they are not able to participate due to negligence or fear or whatever it might be, there is always a type of censorship because the person that having the, the opportunity to do good doesn't do it because of fear of the retributions he may receive. We must remember that nobody knows the names of those that put their, that nailed Christ on the cross. Nobody remembers the name of the people that turned him in. Very few people know the name of the people that censored him. But everybody has very clear the name of the per, that negligent person that having the opportunity to do good preferred to wash his hands. And that is why still 2,000 years later, his name still appears in the Catholic faith, Pontius Pilate. And that is what happens to us a lot. We recently learned of a killing in Oregon, and we know that Chris Herman, which is the name of the person that murdered nine people, he would ask them before he murdered them, are you a Christian? And if they said yes, he would shoot them in the head. And if they said no, he would shoot them anywhere else or he just left them there. That situation, nobody has questioned it. Nobody has pointed it out. Nobody has gone out and said it. And I think that in these terms, having these liberties, today the church must have a more prominent role. I don't want to carry it too far. I don't want to talk about Forum 18 or Human Rights Watch or everybody that's participating in this theme, but there must be a type of unity because with in unity, the governments that must serve its citizens are taking rights that are not theirs to take. In section 134 of the Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, that governments are instituted for the benefit of man. Nevertheless, our people in Latin America, including Latin America, we have strong governments and weak societies. And this does not make it plausible for us to reach and, and bring progress that a strong society requires. Not only the participation of families and parents that educate, but also the participation of religion, which must have these opportunities to participate because they form a public opinion conglomerate, which must influence in the po politics of the country. Being held at the margin, it has allowed other people to come and, and state what they want and be given that. There are themes such as abortion and and the government has allowed the, the marriage of homosexuals, which is not yet recognized in the Constitution. And all these things are brought before legislatures. Governments and parliaments must change their constitutions to allow these differing. Well, I would like to marry, um, mention a curious case where in Chihuahua, uh, there was an outcry from several churches that were opposed to these ideas and there were several 
La jurisprudencia obliga a los órganos jurídicos. Pero a los representantes del pueblo, como son los parlamentarios, tuvieron convicción. It was interesting that although they were speaking out against or were in opposition, then the government came in and gave their opinion. So, so now, for now, it's being handled case by case. But the laws were not passed because there was participation from the religions. Yesterday, we heard from um, Alfonso Santiago, where he mentioned that there are few and rare occasions where the opinion of religion is considered, but it should be the norm, not the exception. Because we can see, like in Alabama this last Monday, they, they are basing their rule to not allow homosexual marriages from a law in 1961. When this law was established, this was a law that was established should not permit interracial marriage. So in, to relate this law to the present, it's irresponsible. New decisions and determinations must be made, especially when we are thinking that we are in of the correct opinion. So these things must be done with equilibrium because being idealist implies that we must have our feet firmly grounded. The idealist is that person that has his feet firmly planted, but he has his eyes open to all types of knowledge and all types of experiences, but at the same time has a fun, has fundamental values that subordinate anything that is transcendental or frivolous and seeks for truth and righteousness. Being idealist, we must seek this balance where we don't talk about just imposition on the church to the state, but also not that the state forces or imposes itself upon its citizens. There must be a balance. So this requires people that with intelligence are able to assume the responsibilities from the top of power to the, its people that expresses with freely his opinions, such as is stated in this forum. Thank you. Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you to the organizers for the invitation to this marvelous event. Again, I would like to thank this law school for opening its door to us. First of all, I would like to extend a hello from Presidenta Soraya from the institute which I represent in, na in the name of the federal government. The intervention that I will share with you, I would like to highlight it particularly concerning the government when it comes to religious liberties and particularly in how the use of laws, specifically real estate law, constitutes a clear display of how federal government wants to recognize the importance of religious associations but also how it wishes to establish now, when it comes to the religion, it is, there is a principle that is available of the separation of the state and the churches, but as, as my colleagues have expressed, the, the constitutional text recognizes in the, in the judicial area and also it exercises the right they have the right to exercise things that they need to. Also, there might be some aspects that there has to be, we have to look into the rights to exercise the worship, but maybe that is something that the moment will come in when we talk about this. Also, there is a willingness from the Mexican state to recognize the religions in the area of worships, and it is something that it has to be part of society, especially from the contemporary, and also because of the politic system we have decided to adopt. What I'm trying to say is that what is happening in Mexico after many, many, many years, it tries to reflect that particular thing that we need to do at this moment. But the public politics 
it actually has to be right on the letter. Let me just tell you a little bit brief at the institution that I'm offering so I can offer a clear view of my arguments. The Institute of Management and Valuation of National Property is a decentralized body of a Secretary of State of the Civil Service, which among other functions is to manage and regulate the federal real property. Today, the federal property system is around 103,000 buildings that are in the country, which half of them, which is 63,000, are used by religious associations in matters of public worship. Now, on buildings used for religious or public worship, there is a before and an after. Now, on January 28, 1992, occurred a nationalization of the properties through the constitutional reform that were used for religious purposes. This means, in plain terms and in plain buildings, not to change them, but they will remain. But also the property will not become part of the heritage of religious organizations, but are part of the heritage of the nation, period. We are facing a condition that aims to offer an area of special protection. The, the federally owned property by law are indefensible and inalienable. This level of protection ensures that the property used for this purpose have the same range of legal protection like against invasions such as those used for the provision of a public service. We are therefore faced with a legal provision that promotes religious freedom through respect and appreciation for the public worship of using state assets with an objective of strengthening the social fabric through religion. Mexico, with over 112 million inhabitants, according to the latest the latest official information recognizes 8,314 religious associations registered with the Ministry of Interior. Can you understand this information with the complexities of the Mexican authorities to address the issue, but also the intention and interest to meet them under the principle of equality among them? That's what we said before, recognition of plurality, in this case, religious and occupation of the public policy issue is a matter that the Mexican government has taken very seriously. In this way, and due to various changes in the organization of the federal executive power and, the, and that comes from the constitutional reform, was necessary for the Mexican government to develop a public policy of economic nature to have a special arrangements to meet the housing need of religious associations. Now, in this context, is where that's where this organization in Davin comes as an organization that has been preceded by even a Secretary of State, the Secretary of the National Heritage, which has the special shade of legally regulated federal properties arises. Now, I explain. 92, Reform 92, nationalizing temples open to the public, called today is a general declaration. The materialization of such undertaking requires a specific legal procedure. That is, it must establish that particular areas was open to the public worship before the date and perform that task on a shared basis with religious associations. As part of the benefits of obtaining a declaration of nationalization exemption from tax are to the real property, which is tax collected by the municipal authorities, and that naturally revolves around the extent of the surface, but also the defense of property against individuals or against other orders of government. That is, if the surface that corresponds to the religious associations is threatened or is invaded, the federal government through administrative recovery procedures, including the use of law enforcement or through judicial processes who undertake the defense of the property. 
In short, the way for the formalization of nationalization are three, administrative, judicial, or by an act of recognition of federal property. We have such a great task to do to all these buildings. It is a matter of both the authority as a religious association forum like this that promotes freedom in our you and it also uses spaces to strengthen ties between government and society. I would like to share with you that there is different service in Mexico and the institutions. And it shows that the church, not just the Catholic, but the church as an institution, has a high percentage of public trust between 60 and 70 percent. Even this is a constant, is something that happens in Latin America where also the political parties, as an example, they have the worst part. But this confidence should serve to contribute not only social stability from the perspective of the exercise that we have been talking about of the public authority, and also it may be worth calling governance, but also the confidence should serve to assist the government in what we think of as democratic governance is nothing but the possibility of organized society as a religious association involving the design of public policy. In this case, the property, but not only this, and also supervise and help the authority to find ways to improve. We are on that path and spaces like this are used to find areas for improvement in the government in the name of religious freedom, the government, social stability, and peace. Hopefully the next time we share as we move forward in, in this direction. Thank you. Thank you very much to all our participants. We now we have a couple of minutes for questions and answers. Does anybody have a question? If you could please stand up and use the microphone. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning to all of you. I would like to ask Luis Fernander, can you please clear up for me because I'm with a little bit of that with what happened with the Treaty of Free Trading in Costa Rica. I was talking yesterday with your colleague colleague Mon Mon Monica about this topic. I remember that there were obstruction, there were problems, there was a situation in which an article was not susceptible to be modified because it was constitutional. However, it got modified and to the referendum that you made reference. So what was the, the take of the Catholic Church and the others on that? What was their role? You mentioned briefly that there was a role of the Catholic Church, but it wasn't clear to me what was it. it was it in favor, against, or, or all of the above? Yes. In this discussion, the Catholic Church in the beginning was divided. Various parishes took different positions, some for, some against. There was several letters that came from priests, and within the same church, there were uh, there was public outcry of all types. The Episcopal Conference, seeing this situation and feeling that the Catholic Church had lost its how legitimate it was, what it did was to make a decision to free itself of public opinion, and it. It made an official declaration where it highlighted the situation in its place. What it did is to call all the worshipers to participate in the referendum and to make sure to go out and vote. But I wanted to highlight it that way because it was kind of a different participation than that which traditionally takes place. So in the end, the call in, in all of the temples and parishes was that they make sure to participate in the vote, not it, mattering what the opinion of their priest was. In question for Luz Fernando. It is very surprising to me that in the description that you made, it seems like 
like if it was like description of something very positive, when in reality, it seems to me that what you're describing was that the assets and or the buildings of worships, they are uh, they are just uh, being protected. But I'm thinking that in any type of state or any type of building, my home, the state will have to protect it regarding of any invasion of any third party. So that protection, I don't understand. Why would I suppose that they will perhaps be neutral or will not be neutral? Or I would like you to tell me why uh, with this advancement, the, the final point of this, um, because they were, uh, they were there. I mean, you know, what would be the what would be the the risk that it will take if this building? And the question is, I mean, would it be better to move forward in the worship? Um, and I don't understand why, in order to protect the, the asset, it has to be a part of the... Yes, Father, I think you're right. I mentioned that there was a constitutional reform in the year 1992, and this constitutional reform gave religion more rights. Now they have the right to acquire any type of good, including real estate, and they become private property. Those real estate goods that were open before this state by constitutional disposition became property of the nation. So it made it so that they were not able to hold these goods as private goods, which had some things to do with like maintenance and things like that. But today, we are unable to change its use. We are guaranteeing that their properties, and this is something that happened more than 13, 14 years ago, we are guaranteeing that the use should be specifically used for public worship. So we are guaranteeing the use of the goods. It doesn't apply to private property. Private property does not, the federal government does not have a, it does not participate in that. There is perhaps maybe some violations of judicial law that could that could be made, but in these particular cases, we are the ones that kind of uh, oversee this private property. So I think it is a, a positive thing. The each church have certain certainty of the use of their real estate and its use. We do implement some exceptions. When it comes to taxes, a property that was acquired after 1992, and I think this this is something that should be highlighted. One last question, anybody? Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the participants, and thank you for the singers and everybody.